There is a tremendous amount of satisfaction that comes from building something. Sometimes the building process can be challenging and sometimes it's tedious, but it is worth it when you see the finished product. The greater the project, the more satisfaction it brings. Building a Lego model is fun, building a house is even better, and building a life on the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done is better still. Together, we will learn to build our lives upon the rock. So today's topic is prayer. We're continuing in our series called Build, and we're looking at uh, some of the topics that are also being covered in Alpha, and this week we come to the topic of prayer. And for me, I go through cycles in my prayer life. Sometimes things are going pretty good, and other times they're not going so good. I have these rhythms of successes and failures, and uh, you know, every once in a while I realize I'm just getting kind of sloppy in my prayer life. And uh, usually what that means is I'll, I'll go out, I've told you guys, it's like I'll go out and I'll buy a couple other books on prayer. And so I'll go and read those books on prayer. Of course, what I should be doing is praying instead of reading about prayer. But that's what I do. I go out and I buy another book on prayer. I think I bought three this week because, you know, you know it's, it's just the, the, the rhythm. But, uh, you know, when I get sloppy in prayer, this is generally what my prayers will sound like. If uh, when I am uh, at this, you know, kind of a place, I say things like, God, you are such a nice God. Thank you for another day. Thank you for the snow. You know I like the snow. Thank you for a chance to teach. Please let these people who are listening to me this morning like me. Please make my team win today and the other team lose. Please let me not run out of chips or salsa or beer. Amen. You know, mostly it ends up being all about what's happening at this very moment in my world. I wake up, I see snow, I pray, I think about something. I, you know, it's, it's a big game day, so today I have to think about that somehow. And suddenly it just is all of these sort of shallow and superficial prayers, and I realize what I've done is I've gotten sloppy. And I haven't been investing uh, my own even thought or energy into this thing. And so I look through my week, and I think about the prayers we've been saying when we go to eat together as a family or when we put the kids to bed at night. Uh, or even when we meet together as a staff and, and we pray throughout the week, uh, we, we try to carve out some moments where we can be praying together as a team and praying for you guys. And uh, if we're not careful, things can get a little bit redundant and what I like to call sloppy. So we're calling the, the metaphor we're pushing this morning is the idea of walls because we talked about Jesus as the foundation and the door of the cross and the foyer, which is faith and it orients you to the whole house. But the walls really do hold up the structure of the home. It's how you experience all of the spaces and it, and it gives the, the strength that you will need for the rest of the structure. So we, we are talking about prayer as sort of the walls of this house that we are building. I think it's also appropriate because for many of us, we feel like in prayer, we often hit a wall. We are running along and all of a sudden, boom, what's going on in my prayer life? How come it doesn't feel like anything's happening and I'm not moving anywhere and I'm not going to make any more forward motion? But learning to pray and then praying will become a natural and it is an essential part of our relationship with Jesus. Now, I know for some folks who are coming out, you're checking out the church. You're not even so sure about Christianity. You're at a very early stage maybe in your own spiritual journey. And so you might be skeptical about this whole thing. It just feels like one more of those mythologies of religion that uh, don't really uh, hit where you're at. But others of you, and I'd say it would be more of you, you're not so skeptical about it as much as you're saying, I don't even know what to do. I don't know where to start. I'm new to the journey and I just don't even know what, what prayer, like I, I was taught to say a prayer over and over again, depending on how bad I was that week. And so, you know, that, that's all I really know about prayer. And so what is this whole thing? What would it look like? Where would I start? I'm hoping that this morning we'll be able to, to give you a little bit of helpful guidance toward that. Others of you here, you've been around for a little bit longer. You just feel guilty for not praying enough because you know it's important and you've had good experiences, and now you're just saying, I wish I could do better. And you're even, and there might even be a little bit of it that says, you know, I, 
I'm actually a little nervous that God's not happy with me and he might punish me because I, I, you know, like he's going to do bad things to me because you sort of can sometimes, we all I think can start to view prayer as this kind of exchange. If I pray, then God does good things. If I don't pray, he'll slap me around a little bit to get me back to praying more, you know, and so we kind of, you know, hopefully this morning we'll be able to, to wrestle with some of that as well. There are also others here uh, who you might just feel like it's not even any of that thing, those things. I just don't believe that I should be bringing all of my little worries to the all-powerful creator of the universe. Like, really? I'm going to trouble him with all that's going on in my life? He's even going to hear me? All my little petty worries? Remember that story about the religious guy who prayed all, every day? Faithfully throughout the day, he would start his morning in prayer and he would go through his day praying and he would end his day in prayer. And he was comparing and contrasting his own life to his friend across the street who has no sort of religious interests, more of an atheistic, agnostic sort of guy. And, you know, he, he gives no thought to prayer. But one day, the praying guy, he, he sort of notices that, you know, this guy over there, he seems to be doing pretty good. He's got a nicer house than me. He's got a nicer car than me. He's got a prettier wife. His kids seem to listen to him. He seems genu genuinely happy. And here I am. I'm praying every day, and I'm sacrificing, and I'm trying the best I can. And, you know, my job is hard, and my hours long, and my pay is low, and my, I'm estranged from my wife, and my kids don't really so, seem to know my name. And, and here we are. And so one day he's pouring his heart out to God, and he's like, God, I don't understand it. This guy doesn't pray at all, and he seems to get every good thing, and suddenly I'm praying, you know, and I get nothing. And then suddenly he hears the rumbling, the clouds, and out of the clouds and the thunder, God speaks. And he's saying, you want to know why? I want to know why. It's because you're always bothering me. You're always bothering me. And sometimes we get up to our prayer lives and we say, God, what's going on? You know, we feel like God's upset with us somehow. Like he's angry with us, like we're, we're pestering him. And, you know, I'm only going to bring the big issues to God. You know, the really, really life-threatening, shattering ones. When someone's like close to death, I'll pray. But the rest of it I can't really bring to him. You know, others, you see, there's, there's so many different ways we experience God. And, the, and those understandings and those preconceptions will affect the, the type and the quality, the experience of our prayer lives. So this morning what we're going to do is uh, we're going to work through Psalm 25. So you can open up in a Bible to Psalm 25. We're going to look at a couple of verses throughout here, just get an idea of some of the language of prayer. And we're going to introduce you guys as well to a very straightforward tool for thinking about your own prayer lives. It's an acronym, ACTS, where each letter represents the next phase of of a prayer time that you might be able to create. So we're just going to work through it. It's fairly straightforward. A lot of you have probably already heard it, uh, the, the acronym. It's not uh, new with me uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but it is, a, it is a tool that I have used throughout the years. And often, even in times when I, I seem to be getting a little bit sloppy in my own prayer life, I will go back to this as a model to help me once again reignite and think through what it is I'm doing as I go to God in prayer. So look at Psalm 25, starting in verse 1. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. And then jump down to verse 10. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. You see, the first one is adoration. Adoration. That's the very first part of prayer. If you were to start all of your prayers with just a moment or two, a few sentences of adoration... It might serve you well in lifting your mind off of this world and into another world, out of these relationships and into a better and richer relationship. Adoration, you begin. When the psalmist says, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust, it captures a lot. There's, we can go endlessly about what this captures. The, point, the thing I wanted to point out is you notice that it's Lord in all caps. You guys see that? This is just a helpful thing. In most of the English translations, when you see that, the, the translators are trying to communicate the word that's, that's behind here. So you'll see there are different ways that they write Lord. Usually it's a lower, capital L and a lowercase. This is actually the divine name of God, what they call the tetragrammaton. That's the word Yahweh. It's the, and so when you, you see this, usually the, the translators are trying to say that's what's being used here. So what was that word? Why would David put it in here? 
Lots of words for God or Lord and used for the gods of other nations as well. But not this one. This is a very particular word. When Moses said to God, who should I tell them is sending me? God said, this is who. This, this is my name. This is who I am. It's my essence. And it captures the idea of God's power and his self-existence. He's not dependent on anyone or anything. He doesn't need our prayers. We need to pray. He doesn't depend on us. We get to depend on him. He is the self-existent one. That gives him power and might. It gives him the ability to make good on his promises. But it's also his personal name. See, God could have captured that. We had just said he was, he's God, I'm God, who else am I? But he gave them the name by which they would know him, a very personal thing. You're not talking about your friend or your neighbor or, you know, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. This is, this is your personal God, the one that you know, the one that you can walk with. And it's in that that we begin to experience the component of love from him. So adoration, what is it? Well, it's the, it's the declaring of our love for God. It's the declaring of our love for God. Now, when you love someone, it's usually because of who they are to you or what they've done for you. And you can think about that because in some ways, this is the, this is the same type of thing that develops in your relationship with God. You can adore God, you can praise God, there's all sorts of words that you could use for this, for being your creator, for being your sustainer, for being your redeemer. It's who he is and it's what he does. And that elicits from us adoration or love. Now it's helpful to realize that adoration will look different for every person. So you've got, think about your relationships with the people that you love in your life. Those relationships take on the uniqueness of the participants in that relationship. There would be some similarities, a certain type of respect and language, uh, time with and all that that marks every loving relationship. But your particular expressions of love will look different based on the, the participants in it, you and the person you love. And so you can't expect that your adoration will look just like everyone else's. There are some cues and ways that you can learn and develop in this, but it will be your language of love and his expression of love to you that will mark it most clearly because it can show up. Love can show up in all sorts of different forms. There was a, I heard a comedian, he was talking about his girlfriend who was a vegetarian. And she said to him, you know, that he wasn't a real animal lover. He wasn't a real animal lover because he said, you know, he eats meat and if he really loved animals, he would only eat lettuce, grains, and vegetables. And so he says to her, well, you know, if you really loved animals, you'd stop eating all their food. <laughs> we could both love animals in our own way. Stop eating all their food. Because, of course, expressions of love and how we love things looks different depending on who you are. Now, I guess the one little caveat, if it's even that, that I wanted to, to mention, you, I, you could be told to do something and you would do it. You'd follow your list, you'd follow the rules, you'd go to work, whatever it is. But in this case, we're talking about adoration. Now, you could, you could say the words of adoration, but that, that doesn't capture the fullness of adoration. That isn't enough. Adoration must carry the, the emotions with it as well. For to be truly adoration, it has to carry the, the heart along with it, the emotions. And so in a sense, you could say that we're telling you to, to generate an emotion. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you make yourself feel something? You just either, you, you do feel it or you don't feel it. And so some of you, you come up to prayer and you hear me say, start with adoration. And you're like, yeah, but I don't always feel love. Sometimes I feel hurt or frustration or despair. And I don't always feel love. I don't have that kind of a, of, a, of a relationship. But some of you are early in your journey with God and you're saying, I don't even understand what that means to love God. I fear him, yeah, but I don't love him. And I would say, don't sweat it. Don't beat yourself up for that. Don't get all wrapped up in your own heart and mind and get all nervous about that part of it. Let that part develop. Think about your other loving relationships. 
rarely does it, does it start like that. You don't wake up one morning and, and all of a sudden you went from no knowledge to love. Usually that's lust. That wakes up like that. Love usually develops over time. And it's usually something that is in response to the time you spend with someone or towards serving them that you start to, to grow to love them or them serving you. It's the shared life and experiences and relationship. And out of that, a deep-seated love will develop, one that will endure. The rest of the ACTS model will actually help you develop the adoration component. So you can begin to learn the language of adoration and that you can practice adoration in a way. But don't beat yourself up if the heart isn't yet caught up with what, you, where, what the mind is saying is, our, is the next and natural thing to do. If you want to start to develop the language, the language of adoration, you could be reading the Psalms. It's a great way to, to do it. You could be listening to worship music as part of your prayer time. A lot of folks do that and consider it one of the great ways that they get to kind of create this language. Reading old prayers, the ancient prayers of the saints, great way to, to create this language of adoration that one day might really reflect where you're at with God. So there's all sorts of kind of practical ways that you can begin uh, doing something like that. All right, confession. That is the next part of the acronym, confession, which, of course, is the work that God is doing as we bring our brokenness to him and he forgives us. Look at verse 4. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Look at verse 11. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. The scriptures assume that we are a broken people. This does not surprise God. So we need not fear acknowledging our brokenness to him. He already knows it. The Psalms, Proverbs, they assume it. So for us to be able to cultivate a confession kind of mindset means we open ourselves up to the, the teaching and the instruction that the psalmists talk about. They assume brokenness and they assume a need for progress. But if you don't acknowledge the need, then you have nowhere to go. So confession is the acknowledgement of the truth of God and his word in response to your brokenness and sin. Now, I think, you know, so confession sometimes is very easy because the, in some ways, because the transgressions are so obvious. There are times in our lives where we screw up so big that it, it doesn't take much work. There was a, I read a, an article about a guy. His name was Gudmunder Arthurson. Gudmunder Arthurson, great name. He was 40, he's 46, and he became violently drunk on a flight, which is pretty scary. You know, you got a, a, a violent drunk on an airplane, in, you know, in flight, and uh, so the uh, crew subdued him, and uh, Gudmunder found himself duct taped to his seat. <laughs> it's kind of hard to miss the obvious when you're duct taped to your seat. You start to sober up a little bit. You're like, I think I screwed up. <laughs> like, you know, you can imagine if he took those moments to pray. Dear God, it's Gudmunder. Thank you for the chance to fly. I think I had a wee bit too much to drink and I scared all these nice people. <laughs> Could you please have them loosen the straps? <laughs> like, there's no, you screwed up. You screwed up big. It's pretty obvious to everyone around you. Confession is sort of the next easy and natural thing to do. You know, own it and get, be done with it. It's, it's just so painfully obvious. But of course, not all of sin is that way, is it? A lot of times, We've got to take the time to examine our hearts and to look at God's word, to hear the challenge of the Christian community around us and to begin to examine what's really going on in our hearts. How does this particular 
song or these particular words of scripture or this old prayer? How do these things reveal what's really going on in my heart? And you begin to churn up the, 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 the truthfulness of what's going on, the things that you're often hiding, and you bring those to God. That takes a lot more time and thought and is an essential part of growing with Christ. I'd also kind of as an add-on uh, offer the idea that general confessions are good, but being more specific can be far more powerful when you're trying to release yourself from the shackles of your bad behavior. So being very, spe- very specific can give you some additional resources that you might need. For instance, it would be normal for a person to say, Dear God, I haven't been as loving or kind as I want to be. That's good. You're, you're, you're owning something that you see in your life. That's good. But adding specificity can take it to a whole new place. You could say instead, I was impatient with John. I have been avoiding him and using my words to hurt him. My impatience is all the worse because you have shown me amazing patience. Or, I've been avoiding Jane because I'm angry with her. I have refused to give the forgiveness that I have been given by you. Getting more specific now. When you do that, you're naming the people and the things you've done, and you're even contrasting it with your own experience of God's love. So you could pray, I have not been as honest as I had hoped. Good. It's a good start. However, specificity would say, I've stolen money from my boss through the wrong use of my work time. Or, I have been lazy and plagiarized my homework and term papers. It's sinful for me to cheat, steal, and be lazy. You could say, I haven't been as holy as I would like. That's safe. We keep it nice and distant. We don't need to examine our hearts any closer than that, right? I haven't been as holy. Who wouldn't want to have more holiness? It's a generic prayer. Adding specificity might be, I've allowed my mind to be filled with lustful thoughts about a coworker. Or, because of my anger at my spouse, I've entertained the flirtatious advances of that guy at work. Or, I've allowed the physical relationship with my boyfriend or girlfriend to go too far. I've dishonored her and myself by violating your requirements for godly sexuality. See, this is, this is giving your work with God far more teeth. You're allowing it to have some bite. And when that takes place, you're starting to examine yourself more carefully. And now that you've named these things, it somehow gives you more motivation, more ability to move past these things, to truly repent, and to make some progress in in, on, in, on coming in, in future days. So I think in that way, confession can become a very healthy and healing process because you begin to now see yourself as you really are. And that can be a good thing. It can be a frightening thing. But it's a good thing to see yourself as God sees you, to see yourself really often as others see you. You know, the, uh, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, they recently noted that chin implants, I didn't actually know they could do these, these things, they're up 71%. 71% for a chin implant. So uh, the, one of the startling things was it was expanding among young people. So it's skyrocketing, and younger and younger people are actually getting chin implants. Now, in, in case you weren't self-conscious enough, there you go. Now you've got to think about whether you needed a chin implant. They have come up with a probable cause. Any guesses to what that might be? They're saying video chats, FaceTime, and Skype. So you get up your little tablet, you see yourself there, you're like, <gasps> whoa. <laughs> right? They're saying that lip augmentation and cheek implants are up as well. You're like trying to, now you see yourself as others see, you're like, wow, that's what you guys have all been looking at? When you let yourself be known before God with all of your brokenness and all of your warts, there's... There's a type of health that comes to your soul and a freedom that comes when you realize that he sees you for what you really are. And when you agree with him, 
Now healing and wholeness can be brought into the conversation. You don't need artificial fixes, a little you know, touch up here or there. You need to have God do the deep work in your soul to transition, to transform who you are into something better. The, uh, la- the next one is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, that's the third one, which is simply the cultivation of gratitude. Throughout the Psalms, you can see, for an example, in uh, verse 3, no one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. What is the psalmist doing? He's saying, God, you are the, the dependable one. No one will have shame when they, when they, they trust in you. There is a gratitude that comes when we begin to see God for the good he's doing all around us. You can go through all of these and get a sense of this, this desire to see the goodness of God. In uh, verse uh, 15, he says, My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. He's always focusing on God. He's always seeing the work of God. And wherever you see that work, you give thanks to him. And you can work this into your, your daily experiences of prayer. In fact, you could work this one most readily into every moment of your day. As you go through each and every circumstance or situation, you can offer them back up to God and know that he is a good God and he never will uh, disappoint us. That even when we don't see it, when we don't understand it, even when it hurts, that he must be doing some good and we can be thankful for the, the work that he is now doing in our hearts, even if it is painful. That when this takes place, you begin to practice gratitude like this, you'll increase your awareness of God's involvement in your day-to-day experiences. And throughout the day, you can begin to see his hand moving in ways that you often would have originally thought either were coincidence or he was not involved in any way. You begin to see the hand of God and the movement of God as you cultivate this kind of experience. So if you were doing this and you were kind of creating this uh, reality for your uh, walk with God, now press it past thankfulness for your own experiences of God. If, you, if you've already got that one mastered, now start to be thankful to God for the other things you see, his general goodness and power for what he's doing in the, the lives of other people, for what he's doing in uh, the, the lives of coworkers. When you're reading a news story to see the goodness of God, you see now you're starting to think of him not simply in relation to you, but in a broader relationship with the world around you. So you can press your own uh, gratitude past that. Supplication, that is uh, the last of these. God is honored when you ask him to meet your needs. When uh, you read the psalmist here in verse 2, he says, I trust in you, do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Very specific prayer about what he needs from God. He's just asking him, and he does not. You'll see throughout the scriptures, they do not hesitate to ask God. Look at verse 16. Turn to me and be gracious, for I am lonely and afflicted. Look at verse 20. Guard my life and rescue me. Verse 22. Deliver Israel, O God, from all their troubles. On and on and on, you will see the the writers of the scriptures asking God for things, making their supplications known to him. I know for many of us, this can be a very difficult thing because how is it that the all-powerful God would even remotely be able or interested to care about me getting a parking spot at the mall. Now, I'm not really sure those are normal prayers unless you've got some very cool reason for it, but we often feel like all of our prayers are in this category. Really, I'm going to ask him to help me out with this problem I'm having at work or at school or with my friend. or This is kind of like ridiculous stuff. But when you bring your request to him, even in ways that might seem petty, You're acknowledging his role in your life. You're honoring him as the provider. And this is a good thing. It's a great disposition of the heart to cultivate. The story is told of uh, Albert Einstein. When he left Germany, he got a house in Princeton. And of course, world leaders and some of the greatest scientists from all over the world would come and visit him there at his house. But the stories are told that those aren't the only visitors he would entertain. Emmy was a young girl who was struggling with her grade school math. And she heard that a nice 
man down the street was good at math, to say the least. So she started showing up at his house asking if he would help her with her homework. So this was going on for a couple of weeks. She would go over and he would help her with her homework. One of the neighbors saw Emmy going into Einstein's house and went and told her mom and said, hey, you know, your daughter is bothering the smartest man in the world right now. And so the mother was horrified that she, would possi- she could possibly do this. So she told her daughter, you absolutely cannot bother that man. He is really important and very busy. And uh, then she went over to Einstein's house and apologized for her daughter. And Einstein, of course, said, no. Anytime I can help a young mind who loves to learn, I, I, I enjoy it. I love to do it. And he helped lots of kids, apparently, the story goes, with their homework in math in his neighborhood. He actually told the mom, please don't stop her from coming. Now, how much more so is the creator God willing to help with our grade school math problems, with our, our low-grade pro- kinds of issues? So bring the whole spectrum to him. Bring them all. Ask about the needs around you, the, wor- the needs you see in the world, the needs you have for in, in your friends' lives. Uh, find the lost people around you, those who are far from God. Pray for them. Pray for their needs. Offer them up to God in a consistent and ongoing fashion. So that is the acronym. You apply those principles in a regular set time of prayer. That might be something, the next step for some of you who have never really had a discipline of prayer. Then just pick a time. Same time, same place every day. Start with 10 or 15 minutes. And just say, you know what, I'm going to give those 10 or 15 minutes and I'm going to go through this acts model. I'm going to have a few moments for adoration and confession, thanksgiving and supplication. I'm going to work through those in a, in a set time. That might be, you know, you wake up in the morning, six o'clock in your den. Find your time, find your place, and make that a, a consistent and normal part of your journey with God. Then try to bring a prayerful attitude into all of your day. So throughout the day, you begin to create an ongoing dialogue with God. So you see something that you want to pray about, pray about it right there in that moment. You see something going on in your heart that you don't really like, confess it and move on. You see a a need around you, someone hurting, pray for a friend, offer to pray for them. You'd be amazed how many people will take you up on that offer. They, they They want, they need, they know it in times of need, and they would welcome your prayers for them. So you build this lifestyle of prayer. You have a set time, and then you build a lifestyle of prayer. A lot of folks also say that journaling has been a key thing for them. Some of you here have said, you know, journaling has been one of the best possible things I could ever do for my prayer life. Some of you actually journal your prayers. You write them out. So you read a little bit of a scripture and you write out your prayers. You could even use the Acts model to write out your prayers and add both specificity, depth, creativity to those prayers. Others, you just list out your requests so that you can go back later and see how God has answered. People even put dates on the time where they realize that God has answered their prayer. That's been a very powerful thing for many, many people to see God's faithfulness over the course of years. Some of you might create a prayer calendar. You say on, you know, each day I'm going to go through in my my prayer time, I'm going to set up, on Mondays I'm going to pray for my family. And on Tuesdays I'm going to pray for my coworkers. And on Wednesdays I'm going to pray for my neighbors. And so then each day of the week, you know you're praying for something different uh, and being more specific in each of those categories. Some of you have picked up books like this, where every day it will lead you into a prayer for some part of the world, Operation World. And every day it'll, it'll introduce you to the, the needs of global Christians and how you might be able to lift up their needs and pray and partner with them all over the world. And so this is, has been a tool that many have used to enhance their prayer life. These are all just strategies. The gist is that prayer ought not to be a burden. It isn't something... That, that should cause uh, distress or fretting. It's a time for you to draw close to God and for him to draw close to you. It's a time where you get to take your burdens and you get to lay them at, the, at the, the foot of the cross and you get to immerse yourself in God in such a way that you begin to experience and see an ever-expanding kingdom all around you. It's his gift to us. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're asking that you would do this and even more in our lives, that you would cause our hearts to be so drawn to you that we would desire to spend our quiet time with you, that your presence would be made 
so real that even moment by moment that we can just check in and reconnect with you. I pray, Lord, that as a congregation, as a church, that we would be known increasingly as a people and a place of prayer. So we ask, Lord, uh, that you would do that even more. In Christ's name, amen.